scenes, sorts a lot of our, our tech out, but it's got a real heart for God. He's a worshipper in everything he does. So give him a warm welcome, and uh, I'll, I'll hand over to Rick. I'm just going to pray for him. Lord Jesus, thank you for Rick. Lord, I thank you for the heart that he has. Lord, I pray that you'll just be with him now. I pray you'll just know your presence. You know that calmness and that peace that comes mm. when we trust in you. And I pray you just help him deliver what you've put in his heart and that we'll be encouraged and strengthened and challenged today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Fab. Right. It's great to be here together. My first task is to sort this furniture out. So I can go there. I'm going to put this over here. And I, I, there you go. I can see you now. Much better. Okay. Well, good to see you all. My name's Rick, as Dave already said. So um, looking forward to sharing some things that God has spoken to me about through passages that, um, from Acts that we've been working through for a few months, years now, maybe even. We've been, it's, it's, a, it's a good book, it's a long book, but we've been really digging into it. We've called our series on the book of Acts, Believers in Action, because we believe, just like the church back in the early, early times of the Bible, in the New Testament, that they're a church who didn't just believe in Jesus, but they had the power of his life working in their lives. And that's what we want for ourselves. We want to be a church that has the power of our lives working in our lives. So we've called this series Believers in Action. And my, my uh, talk today is called His Life is in You. His Life is in You. And I'll unfold what that means as we go through. Um, I'm going to speak for about half an hour or so, and then we're going to just um, do some more worship and, and open ourselves up to what God might be wanting to say to us personally this, this morning. So, let's read the passage together. My aim for us this morning is that we would, in the, with this title, His Life is in You, that we would grow in our confidence of Jesus' love and power at work in us and through our lives. So that we would grow more confident in Jesus' love and power at work in us and through our lives. All, all artwork this morning, by the way, is um, credited to Hannah. She gives us some good sketches this morning. The first one, if you go back to the first slide, you can see her first... Um... Are we on? Yeah, there you go. That's the first one. Yeah. His life is in you. That's me. Okay. So if you've got a Bible with you or you've got your Bible app on your phone, please turn to Acts 20. We're going to be reading from verse 1 through to 16. Okay. After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now, when he had gone over to that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him, as, was, as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And Sir Peter of Berea accompanied him to Asia. Also, Aristarchus and Secundus of the, of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derbe, and Timothy, and Tychicus, and Trophimus of Asia. I did practice. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. These men going ahead waited for us at Troas. Now, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together, and in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down, fell on him, and embraced him, saying, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Now when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten and taken a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. And after, they brought the young man in alive, and they were not a little comforted. 
which means they were very comforted. <laughs> it's a double negative, isn't it? Then we went ahead to the ship and sailed to Assos, there intending to take Paul on board, for so he had given orders, intending himself to go on foot. And when he had met us at Assos, we took him on board and came to Mytilene. There we sailed from there the next day, came opposite Chios. The first day we arrived, the following day we arrived at Samos and stayed at Trogilium. And the next day we came to Miletus, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus, so he would not have to spend time in Asia. But he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. And we'll stop there. So this passage is kind of neatly divided into three sections. The first section about the ongoing travels of Paul and the people that were with him. The middle section about this little story, it seems to be just, just squeezed in there really, about this young guy falling out the window. And, and the last section, of their ongoing travels. And as we've been reading on through Acts, we get this sense that Paul is, he often, the story that Luke describes in this book of Acts about Paul is that he's often, he's traveling in a direction. He's got something in mind about the next thing that God's got, got for him. And particularly now, he's heading towards Jerusalem, maybe having in mind the same pilgrimage that Jesus had as he headed towards Jerusalem, because Paul knew that God was taking him there, but there would be trouble when he got there. So this morning, I really want to just dig into the middle part of this passage about this young guy, Eutychus, who falls from the window. The story kind of sets itself up like a, like a television drama or something, like maybe an, an episode of Casualty where the, the, everything seems completely normal, but you know it's Casualty. It's completely normal construction site, isn't it? And it's like power tools and, and um, saws and drills and things and heavy blocks of concrete but everyone's just behaving completely normally, but it's, it's, it's something like casualty or some other hospital drama where you know that actually things are far from normal and probably something's going to go very badly wrong. Otherwise, you wouldn't bother watching it, would you? <laughs> and that's, maybe that's what's happening in this, in this little story where there's just a normal church gathering like there is this morning. They, they have a heart to gather and hear what Paul has to say to them. Probably it's at the end of the day, we expect they, 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 they speak about these oil lamps in the room, so we expect that it's probably at the end of the day, maybe after a long day of work, the sun, sun's gone down, the people are gathered after their working day. The room lit with these oil lamps, maybe making it stuffy and warm. And this young lad, just wanting to hear what this dynamic, powerful preacher was saying, but at the same time getting a little bit sleepy and not wanting to miss it he, he shuffles over to the window to get some fresh air and he perches himself on the window ledge breathing the coolness of the night but as Paul's voice continues it, his eyes grow heavier and his voice sometimes maybe like a, a, you know when you're in a train carriage and there's that kind of movement of a train and then the click clacking of a track and you just feel yourself dropping into a deeper and deeper sleep and then suddenly the air is rushing around you and you just don't know what's going on you're falling through, through the air and you're, you're grasping you're twisting you're trying to just get hold of something to stop this the ground that's rushing up towards you, and then thud. You hit the ground. And you can imagine the panic, can't you, in the room? Everything was just so normal a minute ago, and this, this young lad has disappeared. Where's he gone? They're leaning out the window, looking over, seeing this, this young guy, twisted and, and broken and motionless on the floor below. Panic and confusion as everyone rushes, rushing around, not knowing what to do, rushing down from the third floor to try and see what's happened and to see what's, what state this guy is in. Paul, too, stops what he's saying and rushes down. But maybe the moment that Paul sees this young lad, he's reminded 
of the prophet Elijah in the Old Testament who, who, would, who lay on the widow's son after he had died, believing that the power of God was going to raise him to life, and he did. And, and Paul, in the same way, put his arms around this broken body of this young man. And as he did, the power of God touched his life. And Paul knew confidently to to say the words, there is life in him. There is life in him. So we see here two things. We see life on one hand, vibrant life in this church that's that's growing and seeing God move, but, but death, unexpected, suddenly. Death's funny, isn't it? We just know. Funny, strange, not funny, (laughs) ha-ha. We just know, don't we? Deep within us, that it's fundamentally not supposed to be. We just know. And we experience the grief, we experience the separation, and we experience the loss. But there's something else, that this world, it, it shouldn't happen. Death shouldn't be sickness it shouldn't be we just have this sense of it being wrong and we try and do all we can to change it it's like a thief in our midst and we want to catch it we want to destroy it but often we're chasing our tails and it catches up with us and this young man as he fell from the window He didn't expect to die this day. In fact, while he was falling through the air, he was still perfectly alive. He was still breathing. His life was flashing before his eyes, but he was still alive. As he hit the ground, his life left him. And that's a story of this world again and again and again. One generation dies. Another generation comes up and tries to survive as long as they can. But we know, don't we, that Jesus came to show us a different story. In the New Testament, John says, in him, Jesus was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. See, Jesus, he's a realist. He says, yeah, there's genuine, horrifying darkness. But he's also, he, he also sees the power in the life that he brings to expel the darkness. In fact, Why we're here today is because many of us have experienced our darkness being impacted by Jesus' light and our lives being transformed because of it. And Paul knew this as well. That's why he went around preaching. That's why he himself experienced at his conversion a blinding light, didn't he? He knew about the light coming into the darkness. And as he put his arms around this young man, he demonstrated powerfully that he believed fully in what he'd just been saying. We won't read it now, but Romans 6, 10 to 11, if, you want to, um, if you're making notes, tells us that the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is at work in us if we believe in Jesus. Paul knew a different story. And he knew a different ending to this tragedy. And believed that the power of Christ in himself would overcome the power of death already at work in this young man's life. Because Jesus, living in Paul, his life at work in Paul, we see a miracle. But what does that mean? As Paul writes to one of the churches in Colossians, 
he, he tells us, he unfolds a little bit more about this and says in Colossians 1.27, to us God has chosen to make known the myst- among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So once you've believed in Jesus, you start seeing differently. You start understanding, ah, it's not about me getting my life right and living exactly following the rules, but actually it's about experiencing the very presence and life of Jesus at work in me. Can we know this today? Or is it just for the Bible times? Can I have world-changing life from Jesus in me? I want to just dip in, have a look at resurrection. Who, who here is, um, who knows anyone who's been resurrected? apart from Jesus. Who's heard of anyone who's been resurrected? Yeah, okay. Well, that's a, if, if you didn't see, there, there are probably about five hands of people who've heur, heard of someone who's been resurrected. In the Bible, in the Old Te- who, who knows how many accounts of resurrection are in the Old Testament? Or guess. <laughs> okay, no, no one's going to have a try. Okay, it's less than you think, actually. Is it, is it, is it on the screen? No, I was just checking it's not on the screen. <laughs> Nine, no, good guess, Ian. It's three. So I thought it'd be more. Actually, in the New Testament, we have six clear accounts of resurrection. But also, um, if you remember, at the resurrection of Jesus, the Bible tells us that many people came back to life and came out of the tombs. And now people have been in tombs are going to, well, it's it's just kind of hard to get your head around, isn't it? But it's not like a a Utica situation with this young lad who's just brought back to life and they're like, oh, he was dead and now he's alive. That's great. This This is many, many days. But there's something about the resurrection life of Jesus that, that so affected the area where he was that it, it shook the power of death that had worked in people who had died. Well, so, Resurrection Day, we, some of us have heard about resurrections today. We hear about people rising from the dead in different situations around the world. Maybe you might have heard it, maybe not. But we can think, well, maybe these stories are maybe weird and wonderful. Or maybe they can stir our faith to think, well, actually, can, can things really happen like that today? Or is there more to it? One resurrection story that um, I, I find so encouraging to hear is the story of Ian McCormack, otherwise known as the box jellyfish guy. Who's heard that story? That's, okay, so you're familiar with it. That's great. If you've not heard the story, um, it's on his, his, the, um, the link to his website is there. In, in brief summary, because it's a fantastic story to listen to, and I don't want to um, do it in injustice, but in brief summary, he was a, a guy, young guy who was living and diving off the coast of Mauritius and swam through a box of shoal, a shoal of box jellyfish, a box of shoal jellyfish. <laughs> and, uh, and they say that a sting from one box jellyfish will kill you, uh, but he was stung multiple times and without a wetsuit as well. So he, um, he was carried by the people who he was with back to the shore, dumped on the shore because they were worried about their friends who were still diving in the sea. And, um, and then he, he basically crawled his way up the beach. Um, it's quite a wonderful story to listen to. But in, to cut a long story short, he went, he managed to get himself through a taxi and then an ambulance to the hospital. But during his ride in the ambulance, he, his body was shutting down. He was dying from these, from these box jellyfish stings. He wasn't a Christian, this guy. He was an atheist, but his mum was a Christian. And at the same time, across the other side of the world, she was woken in the night and was praying for him. And in the ambulance, he started to ha- have um, an, exper- an experience, an encounter with God. And God started speaking to him and showing him all the people he needed to forgive in his life and how he himself, this guy Ian, could be forgiven. 
And while he was unconscious in the ambulance, he made a commitment to Jesus. He gave his life to Jesus. And then he was carried on to the hospital, still, still unconscious. And while he was um, in the hospital, he then he had a, a face-to-face encounter with God where he, he saw the glory of God. And he knew that God's arms were open to him to step in and to fully be complete in knowing God fully as all he is in the joy um, and the, the wonder of having God. And he was given a choice. You can come to me now and be with me forever. This wonderful new relationship that he got with Jesus. Or you can go back and tell your story. And he decided in that moment, his, everything within him wanted to, wanted to go to God. But he decided in, in that moment to, to ask, I'll come back. Because he knew that his mum wouldn't know whether he, he had given his life to Jesus or not. And one of the things he says in his testimony is, you can never know whether someone who's died has given their life to Jesus because you do not know what God's doing in, the back, in, the, in those last moments. And so he committed his life, this is in the 80s, and he's still going around the, today telling his story and seeing that the power of God move through his story. So if you want to catch the full story, um, it's over an hour long, but it's, it's, really, it's, a, it's, a good, um, it's a good one to watch on YouTube. But he's got lots of links on that website. So fra- fantastically encouraging. Oh, and, and of course, the other p- part of the story is they pronounced him dead. And he was taken to the morgue. And that was the moment where he said, okay, I'm going to go back. And, and the, the, the morgue staff that saw him starting to come back to life in the morgue after he'd been pronounced dead. There's, there's lots, lots to the story. It's fantastic. So I encourage you to watch it if you can. So it's a great story, isn't it? And we do hear other stories, and there are stories in the Bible. But why? Why are people raised to the dead? Because from, raised from the dead? Because surely they're just going to die again. In fact, why are people healed? Because we do see healing. We see miraculous healing. We see healing through medicine. But why? Because those are going to get sick again. The statistic of death is one in one. We all die. Healing and resurrection, these things, these miracles, point in one direction. They point to an ultimate healing and an ultimate everlasting resurrection life that is only found in Jesus. And we can know that today. Every healing points to the one who will bring permanent healing and eradicate all sickness, full stop. In fact, without Christ, there is no permanent healing and there is no hope of life everlasting but the only future we can face without Christ is death. Jesus himself said, I am the resurrection and the life. We hear it quoted, don't we, at funerals. But we actually know that that's true right now, right here in this room. The Jesus' resurrection wasn't one where he would come back to life. He was brutally killed, crucified. But when he was raised, he was raised to never die again. He's the first one, the first of many brothers to be raised and never to die again. And if we put our trust in him, we become part of his resurrection life. Something changes within us. It's wonderful. I want to just share two, two fantastic promises with you. To us today. 
When Jesus was raised to life, he was um, seen by many of the disciples and many, many other people. His, the, resurrection of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of the clearest facts that we have here, here, histor, historical data for. We have even more data for that than we have that um, Queen Victoria existed, which is incredible. But in terms of history, we have huge amounts of historical evidence that Jesus was raised from the dead. But after that, after he spoke to his disciples, we know that he, he didn't stay around because he'd be still be here. He'd still be doing the tour. He'd be the, the, the local speaker around the churches physically. But actually, Jesus went up and was taken to heaven. He was taken to be with God. Jesus returned to heaven after his resurrection. Jesus says in John 14, 2, that there are many rooms in my father's house and I am going to prepare a place for you. I would not tell you this if it were not so. For, so our, our promise number one is that he has gone to prepare a place for us. The life, the everlasting, pain-free, sadness-free, death-free life that Jesus now experiences, he is going to bring us into. That's the first promise, that he has got a place for us there. The second promise um, is that he would send his Holy Spirit. He returned to heaven so that he could send the Holy Spirit who will come and live in all the lives of those who trust in him today. His love and power will affect the world through him being alive in us. That's what the Holy Spirit does. In John 16, 7, he said, but I am telling you the truth. It is better for you that I go away because if I do not go, the helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go away, then I will send him to you. So Jesus, we think, wow, wouldn't it have been good if Jesus in his resurrection life could have just stayed on earth, carried on healing, carried on changing people's lives, bringing people back from the dead. But actually, he had another plan, which was that the church, the people who believe in him, would have the same power that he had while he was on earth to be Christ for this world and to change this world. That's what Christian means, the little Christ, because we are those, not who are copying what Jesus did. He's a fantastic model for us, but actually, we're those who have his life inside us. So is, is this life in you? Is real life in you? Is true life in you? Or is death in you? Jesus has opened the way for us to step into life by dying for us. He says in John 524, truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from life, from death to life. It's wonderful news. So how do I get Jesus' life in me? By believing that he died for you and by giving your life to him. And he will give you his life, which will change your life. As a Christian, how, who, how do I see Jesus' life at work in me? Well, there's a few things I was thinking of. Um, and I hope the people around me can see it somewhat. But the first thing I think is um, having this expectation that God will work in my life even when things look bad. Because as, as a Christian, we know that it doesn't, it's not all um, wonderful when you become a Christian, but actually life is still tough. We're still living in a broken world. 
But his life at work in me means that I can see everything differently and have confidence in him, even in the bad times. And also, having the ability to put his priorities, the priorities of Jesus, above my own, above my own needs, and above my own personal gains. We might call this sacrificing our lives for Christ. And there are other times when we sense the Holy Spirit stirring us to step out, to see things change around us. There's one little, a couple of little stories I'll share with you. One, one time I was in uh, Asda, in um, Arrow Park Asda. It's actually Wood Church, isn't it? But they call it Arrow Park Asda. And uh, I was at the checkout, and this lady was serving me who had her, something covered in her hand. She had her hand bandaged. And I, I was like, oh, you know, what's up with your hand? Just chatting with her. <laughs> she said, oh, I had, um, I had chemotherapy for breast cancer, and the chemotherapy went wrong, and it caused a burn on my hand. So I, was looking, I was looking at her hand, and I, was, and I just felt the Holy Spirit saying, pray for her, pray for her. No, I can't pray for her. I'm putting my shopping in my bag. <laughs> but I did. I, I said, I would love to pray for you. And because my wife has been through something similar, and you know, we shared some experiences, and I said, I'd love to pray for you that God would heal this, this burn on your hand. And, she, and it was amazing. It, it was busy, but our checkout was completely... No one was coming to the checkout. It was, it was completely clear. And I said, look, this, this checkout's completely quiet. I'll just pray for you. It was amazing. Yeah, that's a miracle in itself. So it's great. So um, she, let, she let me pray for her. And, um, and, and I've, I've seen her many times since. I, I was, I, it, this story reminded me to ask her again how, her, how it was doing. Nothing changed right then. But um, that confidence and that courage to step out was an evidence of the Holy Spirit at work in me. A second time, we had some friends from my work around at our house, and we were just getting to know, know this, this couple who um, I, um, I connected with through my work, and we had a meal with them, and, that, and, and afterwards, the, the lady was talking about her knees being, being sore, and so they know we're Christians, and I said, well, we'll be able to pray for your knees. And so she, people very rarely say no, by the way, when you ask them, offer them to, to pray for them, but I so we, me, me and my wife Chantal, we, we um, asked if it was right. We put our hands on your knees so we can pray that God would heal them. So we did. And, we, and it's great because you can pray blessing as well over, over the person you're praying for when there's an opportunity to pray for healing. So we just pray that God would bless her and heal her. Uh, and uh, we believe that something of Jesus that is alive in us would do something in this lady's, lady's knees. Nothing seemed to happen. But the next day when I saw her at work, I said, oh, how's your knees? And she said, you know what? It is very, very strange. Because normally, when I go, when I go driving around Liverpool, I have to stop the car every now and again because my knees are really sore and hurting. And yesterday, I drove around for much longer than normal, but my knees didn't hurt at all. They were absolutely fine. And I was like, wow, that's great. That's great. Because we prayed, didn't we? She said, yes, Rick, you've got healing hands. <laughs> you know, it's, no, it's, it's not me, it's Jesus, it's Jesus, you know. But it's a step, it's a step on her journey to finding and believing in Jesus. So we can step out. Things sometimes, God moves powerfully, and sometimes nothing happens, and it's strange. As Christians, if you've been a Christian for any time at all, you'll know there's a, a tension between what the kingdom that's coming, Jesus' kingdom of life breaking in, but also the kingdom of this world, which has brokenness and death in it still. And it's a struggle. We have two things. John 14, 12 says, Whoever believes in me and the works that I have done, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Again, Jesus is talking about returning to the Father, but us having something within us that can powerfully affect the world around us. So we have this commission, this life of living to see the world changed around us. Not just by um, 
doing the important things like serving people's needs and loving people, which is, is, is an evidence of the love of Christ in us, but also believing in his power that he can change things around us. We believe that he can heal. We believe that he can bring new life and, we, and even resurrection life because that's what Jesus did. But we also know that things don't always work out the way we want. We pray and nothing happens. We ask God to change the situation and it's still stuck the way it was. So we have two things in our hands. We have a commission, we have a a call on our lives to believe that the power of God in us can work in this world around us and step out in courage. But we also have a call to trust him when we don't understand why things aren't changed. Believe and trust. We believe God for more but we trust God with the mystery. So my desire through hearing these words, hearing that Jesus went back to heaven to prepare a place for us and send his Holy Spirit to live in our lives and change the world around us, that we would live more confidently that Jesus' love and power is at work through our lives. I'd love to ask Jan and the band to come back or whoever's available just to play as as I finish off. There's a couple of ways I really believe God wants us to respond this morning. 